How more Asian can you get? A half Chinese man in a Japanese pagoda wearing some K-pop merch. You know, a lot of Asian media has gotten big over the recent years. With China and the film market, South Korea and their music, and Japan, well, the anime, but Japan in general has been intriguing for quite some time. But over 100 years ago, one Asian man took the world by storm. This is the story of Seshu Hayakawa. Seshu Hayakawa was born Kintaro Hayakawa on the 10th of June 1886 in Minamiboso Chiba Prefecture of Japan. His family wanted him to become an officer in the Imperial Japanese Navy. However, during a dare to swim to the bottom of a lagoon, he ruptured his eardrum, which resulted in him failing his Navy physical. The incident drove a wedge relationship-wise between him and his father, and eventually, when he was 18, Seshu attempted seppuku, but he survived. After recovering, Seshu went to the US to study economics in the University of Chicago in an attempt to become a banker. His parents knew Wish. You know the stereotypes, it's either that or a doctor. He graduated in 1912 and had planned to go back to Japan via Trans-Pacific Steamship in California. While waiting there, he discovered the Japanese theatre in Little Tokyo and became fascinated with acting, eventually joining. One of the plays he acted in was The Typhoon. A member of his acting troupe, Suru Aoki, who would later become his wife, was so impressed by his acting that she persuaded film producer Thomas H. Ince to see the play. Ince offered to turn the play into a silent film with the same cast. But, because Seshu had plans to go back to Japan, he tried to dissuade Ince by requesting a huge fee of $500 a week. Now, when that's adjusted to 2021 inflation, that's about... $13,352.70 a week. While that's an absolutely mental fee, Ince agreed with the request! With Thomas H. Ince, Seshu starred in The Typhoon, The Wrath of the Gods, and The Sacrifice, all released in 1914. At this point, with Seshu's growing stardom, Jesse L. Lasky, who was a key founder of Paramount Pictures, offered Seshu a contract, which he accepted. It's at this point on where the story gets interesting. One of the films that Seshu starred in next was The Cheat in 1915. The film was a huge success, becoming the third highest grossing film of that year. But more importantly, it made Seshu a star. More specifically, a romantic idol and a sex symbol, making him one of the first, or by some accounts, the first heartthrob of Hollywood. And he was a fully fledged Asian. Women went to extreme lengths to please him. You know that kind gesture where if someone was about to step into a puddle, the man, most of the time, would put a coat over the puddle for the woman to step on so she wouldn't get wet? Well, women were doing that for him. But the cheat also started a second trend. You see, Seshu didn't become a sex symbol for necessarily a good reason. He may be considered good looking, but he wasn't a good guy. The infamous scene for Seshu is where he brands the female lead with a hot iron, claiming her as his. Some women apparently fainted at this scene. He was a bad boy. His performance was apparently nothing Hollywood ever saw before. Women swooned over this taboo romance. Outside of looks, he was known to be quite athletic, being proficient in jiu-jitsu, fencing, swimming, equestrianism, and tennis. Seshu even demonstrated his martial arts skills during the production of The Jaguar's Claws in 1917. Hundreds of extras were constantly drinking, so filming was put on hold. Seshu challenged some extras to a fight where he successfully fought against three extras, knocking one unconscious. And they all got back to work after that. Regardless of his traits, this powerful forbidden lover character became a common theme. Seshu was usually cast as this or a villain. This also led to a very negative reception of Seshu from Japan, as they found these depictions of the Japanese insulting. In fact, The Wrath of the Gods was eventually banned in Japan, among other films. Seshi would eventually grow tired of this typecast and eventually went out to make his own production company, How Earth Pictures. He even turned down the lead role for The Sheik, the fourth highest grossing film of 1921, possibly for the same typecast reason. This was given to Rudolf Valentino, who was like Seshu in terms of being foreign and hot, except he was from Italy, who would later solidify himself as a sex symbol thanks to that film. So from 1919 to 1921, Seshu starred in and contributed to design, writing, editing, and directing of several films. At this point, it's argued that Seshu's fame rivaled Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, and John Barrymore. He definitely had an extravagant lifestyle, driving a gold-plated arrow and living in a mansion designed to look like a castle. He even owned a large liquor supply before US Prohibition in 1920. 
1922, however, Seshi became fed up of Hollywood for multiple reasons, but three events stood out. Firstly, while filming Howarth Pictures' final film, The Swamp, in 1921, Seshi ruptured his appendix. Apparently in hospital there was an attempt to steal his insurance money by men who worked in Hollywood. Secondly, there was a report that Aoki, now his wife, attempted suicide, but there was never any proof of this. Finally, while filming The Vermilion Pencil in 1922, an entire filming set collapsed while filming an earthquake scene. Seshi believed this was an attempt on his life and another attempt on his insurance money. And he also discovered that members of the studio who made the film, Robertson Cole Pictures, were active in the anti-Japanese movement, which was increasing at the time. So Seshu left Hollywood and the US for some time. He returned to America in 1926, not for films, but for Broadway and vaudevilles. He also opened up a Zen temple and a study hall in New York. He eventually returned to Hollywood in 1931 with Daughter of the Dragon. However, this was the 30s. Sound films were everywhere, and Seshu had a thick accent when speaking English. Fleeing in hunger for more and more of your beauty. I cannot bear to see you go away from me. This did not go down well with audiences. Not only that, but that forbidden lover character he was known for playing would soon come to an end, as the Hollywood Production Code came into effect in 1930 and enforced in 34. This means he couldn't portray romance with any other ethnicity but his own, and due to naturalization laws, he wasn't able to become a US citizen. At this point, Seshu left the US to star in plenty of European and Japanese films and plays throughout that decade. He even performed in front of King George V and Queen Mary. This decade brought a lot of popularity from Europe. He was embraced by the French, the Germans found him to be sensational, and Sergei Eisenstein from the Soviet Union, who directed Battleship Potemkin, called him one of America's wonderful actors. But of course, New decade, new Seshu, and the 1940s brought about an event that started a new chapter in Seshu's life. German occupied France. Seshu was stuck inside France with no way out, separated from his family. While helping out the Japanese community inside France, he still managed to star in a few French films during and after the war, and supported himself by selling watercolored paintings. There are also stories about Seshu helping the French resistance as a spy, but Seshu himself has denied this. After the war ended, Seshu continued to live a nomadic lifestyle to the end of the decade. Then, finally, there was a turnaround in Seshu's life. Santana Pictures, founded by Humphrey Bogart, managed to track down Seshu and offered him a role in 1949's Tokyo Joe, which he accepted. It's at this point where Seshu's Hollywood roles changed from forbidden lover and cruel villain to honorable villain. Better to have principles and honor than none at all, right? This was followed with Three Came Home in 1950. Seven years later, he would go on to star in the most acclaimed film of 1957, which would become the highlight of his career, playing Colonel Saito in The Bridge on the River Kwai. You speak to me of corn? What corn? The coward's corn! What do you know of the soldier's corn? Of Bushido? Nothing! With that role, he secured an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor in the 30th Academy Awards. He didn't win, but don't worry, Miyoshi Umeki won Best Supporting Actress that year, so for Asians and Japanese in particular, it was still a win. He would slow down eventually. The only notable year left would be 1960, where he starred alongside his wife in her final role in Hell to Eternity. Unfortunately, she would later die the following year from acute peritonitis. Seshu, also in 1960, starred in Swiss Family Robinson, one of Disney's most beloved live-action films. Seshu would eventually retire with his final roles in The Daydreamer in America in 66 and Junjo Nijuso in Japan in 67. Afterwards, he dedicated himself to Zen Buddhism and worked as a private acting coach. He would eventually die of cerebral thrombosis on the 23rd of November 1973, at the age of 87. I want to go over why I chose to cover this man. You see, Hollywood, especially back when it started, seemed dominantly white, if you get me. So, it just surprised me that a fully-fledged Asian achieved so much success. Not simply acting stardom, but having his own production company as well. Even though the early 20th century can be seen as a time of racial discrimination in the film industry, Seshu's stardom had good timing. 
At the start of his fame, the Japanese were viewed favorably in American society. Japan was America's ally during World War I, so Americans saw the Japanese as friends. Japan had just opened up to the West a few decades prior, so Americans were eager to learn about the land of the rising sun and saw the Japanese as exotic and interesting, which was opposed to other Asians like the Chinese who weren't even given basic rights. Japan would eventually be given the same treatment, but only in 1922. He's forgotten to a pretty harsh degree. Not intentionally, I don't think. Um, most of his films, especially the ones from the 1910s, are now lost. There are also multiple versions of events in his life, and it's still unknown which ones are true. Some people say he's born in 1886, some said 89. Some people say there's no record of Seshu even attending the University of Chicago, and that acting was a temporary pursuit after a series of odd jobs while staying in California. That French Resistance spy story could be true, even though Seshu has said he never did that. Isn't that what a spy would probably say? I know I've missed out some minor things like him playing American football at university as the quarterback. I also chose to avoid talking about certain controversies because I wanted to focus more on what he did entertainment wise than his personal life. But here's something we can all take from this story that's relatable to modern times. While commenting on his multiple film roles, mostly the early ones, he stated, Such roles are not true to our Japanese nature. They are false and give people a wrong idea of us. I wish to make a characterization which shall reveal us as we really are. In 1949, he further stated, My one ambition is to play a hero. That's mainly the reason why he founded How Earth Pictures in the first place, to produce films that would present Japanese people in a better light. The one film that keeps getting brought up here is The Dragon Painter from 1919, starring both him and his wife, which was a critical and commercial success. Much like today, there's a demand for better roles for Asian actors. In terms of roles for Asians in general, this is where it started. So let's remember this legend. A man who achieved a rare level of success on par with Charlie Chaplin during a time of racial discrimination. A sex symbol before Monroe and Dean. And with that being said, I'm going back to my zen. Cut! Huh. What? This ends our session. <sighs> Great. All I know about Cecil Hayakawa is that this man is a legend. We can read in any book that he was the highest priced star for many, many <laughs> years. I mean, we, we're not denying this, it's a fact, right? But I haven't seen too many of the pictures. Did you usually uh, co-star with American leading ladies? Yeah, you used to. Were you, many years. Were you a menace or a villain or a... a uh, both. Both. Menace, villain and hero sometimes. Did you sometimes <laughs> get the girl? No, very Usually, scarcely. <laughs> very scarcely got the girl. <laughs> yeah. There were two things we were sure of in the silent movie then, that the Indians never got the best of it, and Cecil Hayakawa <laughs> never got the girl. Right? <laughs>